I'm happy to uh, mention that our uh, benefactor is Kintronic Labs uh, there in uh, uh, Bristol, Tennessee. Uh, they've been uh, going for, well, ever since 1949, Louis King uh, started the company. Tom King is probably who you probably uh, have spent a lot of time with in his booth over the years. And now uh, we actually have uh, Josh King taking over as the primary uh, at the company, although Tom is still there, still working with everybody. But Kintronic Labs will be able to solve problems from providing good grief. A, a, a directional antenna system, you unload it, hook it up, and it works. They also uh, work on uh, FM things uh, with uh, combiners, coax switches, uh, LPFM equipment racks, and dummy loads. A lot of good stuff from our friends at Kintronic Labs. Now today, uh, we'd like to um, really have an interesting discussion. And uh, Tom LaBarge is with us. Tom is the principal at uh, Groundlinks. And he is going to talk to us about the need to have an audit of your ground system. It's not just that strap. It's not just the rod, the ground. Tom, talk to us, please. I'll do that. And I thank you very much. And it's good to be back with um, BDR Lunch Gathering. I'm going to start the presentation with a, a variety of, of, of announcements, if you will. Um, one, the presentation that you'll see that's a, a PowerPoint that'll be on in the background here was given to the Tennessee 911 Association. Uh, about three weeks ago, two and a half weeks ago in Gatlinburg, Tennessee. Uh, so a lot of the language in it refers to the 911 world, not necessarily the broadcast world, but it's the same thing when you get right down to it. Grounding is important no matter where you go. Uh, when I do have a, sc a screen that pops up that has reference to 911, just ignore that and we'll think about the broadcast world. Uh, interesting that you brought up in the ham announcement about tubes. Uh, that ties into about tubed equipment. That ties into grounding very nicely and the changes that are going on in the grounding world. Um, the grounding that we have in place virtually everywhere in this country was designed 50 years ago or more. In fact, Ben Franklin is kind of the guy behind a lot of it. And it doesn't work real well for electronic devices. And that's why we encourage people to start to look at their grounding very, very critically because it was designed for analog equipment when you get right down to it. Uh, in the 911 world, all their equipment is new but and, and all very, very digital, but they have uh, massive amounts of failures because they're not grounded correctly. And a failure in 911 is just as bad, if not more bad, more bad, is that a word? Uh, mad, more bad or -er than a failure in broadcast uh, because we're talking about people's lives not just advertisers being mad. We're, we're talking about people, people's lives. And we've been waiting, waiting. Tom, I'm sorry for the interruption. Uh, I just muted those background microphones. And so if you unmute yourself, we'll continue along. Okay, I'm back. Now you're yep. gone. There you are. Okay, there we are. Okay, so some of that said, uh, let me get over to uh, uh, the presentation. The, the, the idea of a grounding audit, let me get the share screen up. Hopefully that will work, bear with me. There we go. The idea of a, of a, of a grounding audit is, again, grounding is generally considered to be something you really don't want to spend any time on and a lot of people ignore. It's not a problem at all in most people's minds, whether engineers or whether uh, uh, station managers or in the case of 911, um, 911 directors, it's not a problem right up until the point where it's a really, really big problem. So to help prevent that from happening, we came up with the idea of doing an audit. And it turns out there are various insurance companies that will do an audit for you as well. And uh, we're dealing with one of them right now and, and trying to re-educate them on how to do an audit from a more aggressive standpoint. It's not just a matter of a bunch of green wires connected. It's not just some copper strap. 
we have to understand a lot more about grounding and what it's trying to accomplish. It isn't just a little bit of a fault current. It's lightning is actually has a lot of AC characteristics to it. And it goes up to very, very high frequencies. 250 megahertz is common in lightning discharge. Um, we're finding out in our research that uh, copper loses the ability to be a, a proper dissipator of, of fault current above 60 megahertz. When you get a lightning strike, you get a lot more than 60 megahertz hitting, and it's got no place to go. So it hits the bottom of your ground rod, bounces out of the ground, comes right back in, and the smoke comes out of the box. We're seeing this at almost every stop we go to where they have traditional grounding in place and they've had a series of lightning strikes and bad things happen. So we came up with the idea of doing a grounding audit in a much more aggressive way to, to look at it very critically. Where are you connected? How are you connected? What is the, the, the structure of your, of your grounding system? Um, it's not something you wanna think about all the time, but it's good to do every so often to make sure everything is working fine. And, and I gave this, this talk to the 911 group. There were probably 120 of them there or so. Uh, we just want, the goal is only, it was not a commercial talk. It was not trying to sell Groundlings products. Uh, we just want people to be more aware of the grounding that they have in their location because it's going to be a problem someday. So like it says on the screen, which hopefully you all can see, our goal is, is simply to increase your awareness of how important good grounding is. Whether you're an engineer, director, manager, knowing what's going on with respect to grounding is a smart play financially. And there's another comment there at the bottom that says it's also the right thing to do in terms of public safety. Well, that doesn't apply to this group so much, but it's it's just the right thing to do. Now, let's see if this screen is going to change on PowerPoint if I click on it. It doesn't. Yes, it did. Yes, it did. There we go. You didn't get the nice effect on it of the curtains pulling back, but it's no big deal. Um, 911 people, and I suspect in the broadcast world as well, you're, 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 as engineers, you're concerned about the budget uh, that you have to operate your facility. If you do an audit and you do it correctly, you're going to have a really good shot at preventing budget busting equipment failures and system downtime. You don't want that 3 a.m. phone call, right, that says, we just had a storm and we're off the air. Let me see if I can get to work again. It does. Look at that. Um, as I intimated earlier, grounding is always out of sight, out of mind. I see the connections. I've got these copper things in place. I've got this, I've got that. Everything's good. Well, as it turns out, it's probably the most overlooked assumption in ensuring the continuing operations of your facility, whether it's emergency communications or not. Look at how well this is working. So I ask this group of people, and I'm asking you, how familiar are you with the grounding of your station or your transmitter sites or, or your, your, uh, any, any aspect of your operation? Have you had any losses in the last five years? It was funny with the 911 people, they were all scared to talk. I asked that question of them and they, nobody talked. And everybody, everybody said, no, we're good, we're good. As I got into the talk, suddenly they started talking about the huge problem they had two years ago where they lost $300,000 of equipment, but nobody would admit to it up front. If they had loss events, and this is for, for you all to ask uh, of, of yourself in, 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 in coming up with why an audit should be done, do you know what the sources of those surges or spikes were? In my preliminary talk, I mentioned commercial inbound power is turning out to be three of five events that we fix originate on commercial inbound power because it's poorly grounded by the commercial utility. And then before it comes into your transmitter or to your station, wherever you wanna protect, you have a single ground rod, which may or, be not, may or may not be connected to your ring, to your, your grounding system. About half the time it is, about half the time it isn't. That's kind of disappointing because you end up with a, a, um, a ground potential rise problem where you want to have equipotential, potential, of course, throughout your site. Uh, the uh, um, inbound power is extremely dirty. I don't know how, if you all are familiar with how dirty inbound power can be. And it can cause all kinds of problems, especially with sensitive electronics. So you need to make sure you can identify where the surges or spikes are coming from. How old is your facility? Just ignore PSAP. That's, the, that's 911 talk for public safety access point or answering point. Uh, there are many, many new 911 facilities out there. 
uh, not so much new in the way of broadcast world. Uh, but they they don't hook up the grounding systems when they build a new building. That's that's also a problem. Uh, they expand. They they that's why that question was there. Um, how many of you have an as built a schematic of your grounding system? Are there okay? There's one. I see one hand going up. I only have four images on the on my page here though. Uh, it's a real good thing to know, and it's a real good thing to know how long it's been there. If you've ever read the fine print on a ground rod, it'll say replace every 10 years. How many of you people have ever thought about replacing a ground rod? Um, and I'm not challenging you with that. It's just that nobody thinks about it. It's out of sight, it's out of mind. And the ground rod may be, in the, I'm doing a facility in two weeks in Jasper, Alabama. Uh, the water table there is six feet below the surface. The 10 foot ground rods have been sitting in water, liquid water for 15 years. How much ground rod do you think is really left? Not a whole lot. They're having lots and lots of problems. We're gonna fix that for them. Um, if you've had losses, are you, are you pretty sure that your grounding is still in, in place? That's why Wrench made reference to the uh, ground rods that were rotted. Uh, are any of you in Florida? If you're in Florida uh, and you're anywhere near the ocean, your ground rods are in brackish water they're probably gone. Um, anything in Florida that's metallic, how long does it last before it's pretty corroded and dull from the salt air? Um, disregard the rest of the, the questions there. Generally speaking, oh, and this is a, this is a Florida site on the, the picture with the clamp on. Generally speaking, to find anybody in our business that's fully cognizant of their grounding system is extremely rare. I'm not saying that any, all of you gentlemen are not, and I don't know if there are any ladies out there or not, so forgive me if there are. Um, it's really becoming much, much more important to be extremely familiar with your grounding system. The image on the right was a, um, a pole in, well, it's certainly not there anymore. Uh, it was on Cape Sandblast, which is near Port St. Joe and the Florida Panhandle, if anybody's familiar with that. Uh, this poll was certainly erased three years ago or four years ago by Hurricane Michael. Um, it measured a thousand ohms to ground on the on the ground wire. That's pretty high. That's not really. Can anybody? Can you all see that? Does that come through? Okay. Uh, it turns out there was a new conven or a convenience store that's no longer there anymore um, that I measured the resistance on as well, and it was seven ohms. I was pretty impressed. It was brand new service, however. And I asked the owners of the um, convenience store why the new electric service. They said, well, we had a lightning problem and it blew everything up. So they put in all new service. With that information, I went back to this pole and measured it again at a thousand ohms. Obviously that grounding did not intercept anything and it ran down the line and, and infiltrated the convenience store and, and, and blew up everything, including all the coolers. Um, I pulled on this particular wire down near ground level and up came a ground rod about 14 inches long. The salt water, we were at an elevation of four feet above sea level, the salt water had completely eaten the ground rod and hence you get a reading of a thousand ohms to ground. Um, it's just things like this you need to take a look at to see what you've got in doing your grounding audit. Now, what that says there, I, I can't see all of it on my screen, but let's look at some of the examples of severely overlooked grounding. And this was an attempt to be a little bit humorous, but this is the most famous grounding failure ever. It was not sabotage. <laughs> it was a grounding problem. Uh, the, this, and and I, it's just to get, a, to get a laugh, but it really was a grounding problem, which caused a loss of, what was it, 36 lives lost, 38 lives? something along those lines. And the famous line from the radio broadcaster, Oh, the Humanity. I think that's what he screamed into his microphone, something like that. I see, is that Rich Wood? I see you're nodding with me. I, I can't hear your audio, but you're nodding with me. And, and, uh, and yes. no, that's, no, Rich Wood's there, it's below that. I don't have a name, but the red, red cap. Um, very briefly, what happened here was the, uh, the dirigible, the, the airship loitered offshore, maybe you all remember, it loitered offshore for about five hours in thunderstorms couldn't come in to land because the winds were too rough. Well, what, what hangs out in thunderstorms? A whole bunch of negative ions, right? The skin of the plane of the airship is aluminized dope. 
it's highly conductive. You got propellers driving the thing for six days or seven days coming across the ocean. You got a lot of static charge there. Uh, when they dropped the mooring line, it was just hemp. They could have discharged the entire skin at that point, but they didn't with any kind of conductor. It was just hemp. It got near enough to that well-grounded mooring tower and you have a lightning bolt. And the rest is history, shall we say. But other grounding failures. These things you may find in your grounding audit, which I encourage you to do. Uh, the first one on the left is at a 911 center in South Georgia. They were having lots of problems with everything in their facility getting cooked, including the, the jail cells of this particular county were in the same building. And the halo that you see there, the halo conductor, it looks like it's a one odd or a two odd. Um, ran around the building and, it, and it, it was connected directly to the ground wires coming off their tower, 300 foot tower, which was getting hit regularly. And then you were asking that current to uh, leave the two watt uh, um, cable and go into that number six wire, it looks like, about a six solid going through the concrete block, if y'all can see that. Well, that's pretty much a fuse at that point. Um, it's not gonna go out there, it's gonna burn it up and everything inside the room is gonna get fried. The other problem with that, uh, and, and again, the, the headline is here, it's just because your leads are present, you've got grounding leads, doesn't mean you're protected. That halo is also in contact with the conduit you see on the right side of the picture. Well, conduit is pretty much the same as the neutral in your electric system. So anything coming into that halo was gonna find its way into the neutral and fry everything in the, in, the, in the building. The jail cells all opened with the last strike because the locks got fried. The elevator system, uh, was uh, uh, there was a conduit that went to the electric system. The, the halo was zip tied to that conduit. That's a problem. So the elevators quit. The, con the, the uh, jail sales open, the computers quit. Just because you've got grounding present doesn't mean it's working right. The middle picture is a TV station, a very famous TV station. Uh, and I don't want to, they've asked me not to tell uh, um, who they are, where they are, but this was a thousand foot self-supporting tower, uh, which we're going to get to a little bit later on if I can figure out a way to show the picture. Um, and it had three of these uh, um, number two solid tin copper wires bonded to a fence post, a galvanized fence post, uh, which is sprayed over but was not ground down to bare steel. And then of course that fence post is buried in concrete. It's not a very effective ground. Every time this tower got hit, they were losing between twenty and thirty thousand dollars of equipment, and they wanted to know why. Well, if you all are familiar with the MythBusters, they were that was one of my favorite shows. My daughter and I watched it religiously as she was growing up. She became an engineer, as it turns out. Uh, Jamie Heineman always said, "Well, there's your problem." That's kind of what we had here. I saw this and said, "Well, okay, here's a pretty good indication." The picture on the right is the same facility. That's the ground wire coming out of their master control room. What's wrong there? Hmm. Let's see. Three ground rods in concrete, a foot apart, in a loop. It's not a real good way to get rid of fault current. You're going to find some of these things when you look in detail. And this one, if you do it as an afterthought, and grounding often is done as an afterthought, and, and again, we, do, we just don't think about it. We don't think it's important. It's really, really important, especially in the digital era. On the left is what's called a, um, a UFER ground. Maybe you're all familiar with that. Using the rebar in concrete in the foundation of your structure as ground. It's in code, it's allowed. It was put in code in 1968. I, hopefully I'm not boring you all to death on this, but a UFER ground was invented by a guy named Harold UFER. He worked an awful lot on that name, apparently. Uh, in 1943, in Arizona, Barry, he was working for the Army. Well, what wasn't available in 1943? Copper. We were making bullets. No copper. Arizona, you get some dandy thunderstorms, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, but they're not that common. Uh, there's also no water in the ground. So Mr. Eufer had to figure out a way to get some sort of ground. He gets this bright idea, well, there's a bunch of steel in the concrete, that'll dissipate things. And it turns out it does to a certain extent, but 
it also there's also residual moisture in concrete and if you put a whole bunch of voltage in there you're going to blow that concrete right up it's not a good idea another thing that's wrong with this that you may see if and when you do an audit is that particular arrangement is asking electrons coming through the ground wire at the speed of light to come as as a charge come through that green wire and then do an instant 180 degree turn and go down into steel which is a different metal altogether of course it's going to cause all kinds of issues there that's not going to ground a darn thing yet it was in place at a mission critical facility it was actually part of an air traffic control site that kind of amazed me next one is a 911 center that's the ground wire that should be attached to the tower it's not <laughs> uh, and then finally is another 911 facility uh, in in Alabama uh, we're based in in the southeast so a lot of our work is done down here as you might imagine um, you can see the grounding is pretty much an afterthought there wouldn't you think and there's more <laughs> yeah 1995 plus shipping and handling uh, but wait there's more we'll, we'll double your order if you just pay handling uh, even when grounding is done to code whether it's r56 whether it's ieee whether it's uh, nfpa 780 uh, uh whether it's ul listed if it's done to code doesn't mean a whole bunch of anything because code is old it's just old it was not designed for digital equipment and electronic devices it doesn't dissipate enough power and enough of the frequency ranges that are in lightning to prevent damage have any of you i, I can't hear any audio but uh certainly some of you have seen damage to um, uh, circuit boards along that line. That's not a good thing. That's happening because lightning has those high frequencies in it. Copper loses the ability to, dis to disperse those high frequencies. It plugs up the grounding system, um, plugs up in quotes, stops the following frequencies from flowing into the ground system. And also you get a reflectivity problem. The reflection, and, and we have tested this in a variety of indications with a TDR, we get great big reflections off the bottom of ground rods. When it reflects, where does it go? It doesn't go into thin air, it goes back into your stuff and turns to heat and heat's a bad thing and smoke comes out of the box, which we don't like. So <clears throat> um, ground links, getting commercial here for a second, ground links has developed a grounding system that eats high frequencies and dissipates everything coming at it. Again, if I can figure out a way to show you a picture I don't think it's on email on this particular laptop. Um, I'll, 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 we have some photographic proof. And again, this is being a little bit commercial. I apologize for that. If this comes through, we'll, we'll see. Lightning hit a, let me give you this one. There we go. That way it's not identified. I don't know if this shows up at all. It's on my cell phone. That's a nice tower taking a direct hit. We regrounded that tower in June of 2021. It's been hit three additional times, and they have not lost one millisecond of airtime, nor lost any equipment. It's because we figured out how to dissipate the frequencies and the and the uh, and the current, so it doesn't bounce back into your system. Um, in the analog days, tubes were a little more resilient, but with the density of electronics on circuit boards and how critical they operate and their inability to deal with temperature extremes, um, we're having lots and lots of problems. So you can have all the grounding in place you want and you may think that it's just absolutely perfect. Um, I'm here to tell you that you need to take a look at it very, very carefully to see exactly what's there and how it's working and, and what can be improved on it. Um, so, this applies to engineers. You get the 3 a.m. phone call. You're going to gnash your teeth. You're going to lose sleep. You're going to get stressed out. A system failure is a bad thing. Yeah, come on now. Go machine. There you go. So here we go. Let's, let's try to get proactive on this. And I don't like that word, but everybody understands it. Let's do an audit. Let's figure out what we got. I know you got a lot on your plate. And I say that uh, in later in the presentation, the 911 people, it's, there's a lot that you got to think about to do what you do. And there's a lot of technical stuff. 
But the, but the common element here in tremendous numbers of equipment failures is grounding, and we don't pay enough attention to it. Go machine, here we go. Questions you gotta ask. What do I have? Where is it? How long has it been there? Do I have the as-builts? What's connected? Is, is you know, I, I, I probably have a main grounding bus. I probably have my, my bus bars at, 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 at my uh, polyphasers. Um, inside and out the building. Oh, oh, oh gosh. Went to a, uh, a, a, a tower site in uh, outside of Lafayette, Louisiana. Big, um, a giant legacy station, 1800 foot tall tower. Big one. Their grounding um, was set up with a uh, number four solid wire attached to the three legs of the tower on metalized tape and hose clamps. They're getting hit constantly. They have lots of problems and losing equipment and losing airtime. It took one look at that and you know, again, Jamie Heineman, well, there's your problem. There were no bus bars anywhere we could see on the tower to ground the coax uh, coming down the tower, 1800 feet of tower. That's a lot of opportunity for bad stuff to get into those wires. Then if they did have it grounded, which they, we couldn't see, then it's had to go through this number four wire from metallized or metallic, what's the word I want? Uh, metallic tape, there we go. Um, held in place with uh, hose clamps. Um, maybe I can find it here real quickly. Uh, there's a pretty good image of it. Bear with me, folks, I apologize. There, there's one. All right. Big tower, grounding wires, hose clamps. Hopefully y'all can see that kind of okay. Not a good way to ground a tower. Did, uh, did lightning blow out the, um, the hose clamps? Uh, those appear to be very new. So it looks like they're doing that frequently. They get hit when we're kind of out of thunderstorm season now. It was probably happened in the uh, November, October, November, December area. Uh, everything looked to be fairly fairly new. I, I would expect it would, if it even got to that point. It may have uh, followed the coaxes down into the, to the studio and not tried to get off at that point. Um, I have not had information from them. They haven't engaged us yet. So uh, big, big question that you need to have in your audit. I mentioned commercial power earlier. Transmitters typically are out in the middle of a field. They're served by power that comes in on a long branch line, an end of branch circuit, which has no other customers on it. Uh, typically, uh, some of it may be buried, a lot of it will be on poles, which will have um, number six solid or number four solid, usually number six solid ground wires, which may or may not be there. They may have been stolen by copper thieves. You may have virtually no grounding before you get to your meter base at your transmitter. That's just a recipe for disaster. And it's happening, like I said earlier, three in five times we're finding commercial power is the villain. Uh, another portion of that is going to be uh, a cable system if you have a cable input, because they just glom on to the, to the electric system ground. And that's a whole another network of wire out there that can have current induced in it. And it's gonna to look to find a home and tag you're it. These are good things to you to think about. Um, when did, when was your facility built? Has, uh, and have there been any changes? Have you expanded? Have there been any upgrades to the grounding? Uh, did you make any changes when you had your last damage event? If you did, if you're lucky enough to not have damage events, um, more power to you. Um, what type of measurements are you taking to see how your grounding is doing? And this is a, a topic that I can rant about for hours. It doesn't do me much good except get me out of breath. The use of clamp-on meters or even fall of potential meters. You're asking a six-volt battery clamped onto a grounding conductor to emulate what 30,000 amps and 250,000 volts is going to do. It's not real logical. In the case of a fall of potential meter, they're typically 12-volt systems. Lightning is going to behave forgive the expression, but whatever the hell it wants to do, it's going to go wherever it wants to go. Trying to emulate that and measure it with absolute precision with a six-volt battery 
just doesn't make any sense. The other problem with clamp on meters and some of these grounding meters, uh, ground, uh, ground resistance meters or resistivity meters is you're taking a snapshot. You're looking at what's happening in your grounding system at a point in time. Tomorrow, if it rains, you're going to get a different number. Tomorrow, if it doesn't rain, you might get a different number. Engineers like to treat these numbers as absolutes. They are at best relative measurements. Please treat them as relative measurements to give you an indication of the performance of your ground system. In addition, too many, and this happens with stamped engineers, not broadcast engineers, but stamped engineers. They issue a big report on their new grounding system they put in place, and they show photographs, and I've seen dozens of these. They show photographs of the little clamp-on meter on the test loop on the ring in the new grounding system or the supplemental grounding system. Um, the test loop comes up from the ring and goes down to the ring. What are you measuring? You're measuring continuity. You're not measuring resistance to ground. And they happily trumpet, your grounding system is 0.05 ohms. Well, no, it's not. The continuity is that you've, you've measured that your copper is all connected together. That's about all you've measured. Test loops are routinely installed incorrectly. Don't always trust a test loop that may be on your site. Uh, a question as to how these meters work. Is it basically measuring the resistance between the ground rod here and another ground rod in the system? No. It injects a current at a particular frequency level. Most of them go up to about 250 hertz. Many good meters will give you a choice of four or six or eight different frequencies you can use to trace. It injects, induces a current in the, in the, in the conductor to go through your ground rod or grounding device, whatever it may be, travel through the ground to the ground rod at a serve, attached to a serving transformer. Goes and, this, and, the, and your system has to be energized. You have to have your commercial power on for these clamp-on meters to work goes up through the ground in the serving transformer, through the transformer, into the neutral in the building, and eventually comes out of the building. It's, it measures how much power comes back on the neutral and the ground out of your building to the meter compared with how much went in the ground. From that, it determines what the resistance was from the ground rod through the dirt going to the transformer. Okay, I think that's basically the same thing um, as what I was suggesting because we do need to measure resistance between two points, and it appears to be the resistance between this ground rod and the remainder of the grounding system, which would be other ground rods uh, attached to that wire. It can go that way as well. You are right. I, I, I didn't, didn't understand your question perfectly, but yes, it is measuring that. It's going in and coming out. Okay, thank you. Yeah, sorry for misunderstanding. No, I'd never seen one of these meters. That's good, thanks. Um, the fall potential meter, you don't need to be energized. Um, it puts its 12 volts in and it, and it at, at a ground rod point or a grounding device point, and you have probes that you install 150 feet, 300 feet away um, that measure current and voltage, and, it, and, and the machine calculates a, res, a ground resistivity measurement. It can also con calculate resistance to ground. Uh, typically, the measure, method that's used is called a Schlumberger method. It was developed in the 1920s by the Schlumberger company, imagine that, for oil exploration. It's really good at determining soil strata. Um, it's okay for determining <laughs> grounding as well, uh, uh, ground resistance. But again, you're using a very low voltage to emulate what something really, really high power is going to do. Questions you got to ask looking at your grounding. I, I can't stress enough how important grounding can be in a highly electronic world. Does anybody have any non-electronic equipment in their system anymore? I think not. I can't hear any of you at, at the moment, but I, I think it's 100% it's digital now. And it's all circuit boards. It's all highly dense electronics. If you let anything get inside your facility, they're all bets are off on where it's going to end up. Even with surge suppression, and this is what we're dealing with, uh, we're dealing with a, a, a customer right now who has constantly having to replace his sacrificial surge suppression. It's hooked up to ground, but the ground is bad. So <clears throat> the surge suppressor tries to intercept the fault current and it's got no place to put it. So it fries itself. That gets to be pretty expensive. 
Um, there are people out there selling surge suppressors saying, yep, this will handle anything, but they don't tell you how much it's going to cost to replace the, the, uh, uh, the surge suppressor. I'd love to hear from any of you uh, if you've had that situation happen, because we're trying to help this person not spend so much money constantly. Uh, we're also working with a big insurance company that's having bad experiences with surge suppressors. So if, if any of you have all had that, let Barry know. Barry will get a hold of me, I guess. Um, more questions. Have you had losses? When did they happen? How much do they cost in terms of direct equipment replacement? It's good to know. Um, grounding is probably at fault somewhere. And for, that's sort of a pun. I apologize for that. It wasn't intended. How many of you have unique geological challenges? Meaning, <laughs> are you sitting on a rock? Um, a couple of weeks ago, four or five weeks ago, I was over in Nashville and I drove by that very unique tower at WSM. Are you all familiar with it? The, the funny, uh, it's a, it's, it's a upside down self-supporter halfway oh, wow. up this guide and then a self-supporter, the other 410 feet going up as a self-supporter based on that base. Are, have you all seen that at all? Does that ring a bell? I guess, I, I don't know or not. The anyway, tower. what's it called? I thought I thought there was a suggestion on what that type of tower is called. I'm not familiar with it. It's uh, Blau Knox. Blau Knox. Blau Knox. Blau Knox. Okay, uh, it's a big one, 810 feet tall, and the point of it goes down to a big porcelain bubble. Uh, I was surprised to see it's an AM tower. I was surprised to see that it's a single tower. And it was one of the original clear channel, 14 clear channel stations uh, back in the 30s. I guess they went on the air in 1932, seems to me. Um, but it's, and I, this is out of my, my pay grade. AM stations typically are in kind of swampy, wet areas, aren't they? I think that's, that helps make a good ground plane. Uh, anybody wants to suggest on that, would be wonderful. That's what the, uh, the rules used to recommend, yeah. Okay, well, this was just a big old pasture, big old open field, and it surprised me. But anyway, I don't think we're going to have any business with them, but I, th I found it fascinating to, to, to see that in a very, very old facility. I suspect the grounding hasn't been looked at in a very, very long time. Uh, we're working with some 911 people that have transmitters on mountaintops. There's four inches of soil. Uh, all around the transmitter building were ground rods that were probably six inches long <laughs> because they hit granite and the tops were all bent over and cut off. Huh. Good thing to be aware of. What's the best thing you can do in that situation on a mountaintop? Well, commercially speaking, put in one of our systems, which only requires um, 24 inches of soil, but not commercially speaking, there are techniques where you can put in horizontal grounding that'll work okay. Not great. Uh, if it is traditional grounding put in horizontally, you have to keep it wet or put continually put electrolyte additives on it. Um, that particular site we proposed for them, they did not accept our proposal, uh, unfortunately, uh, but was to build basically uh, raised gardens, if you will. Um, you know, I, I, what do you call them? Uh, um, People that make gardens out of building, stacking up four by fours and filling it with dirt. We were going to make raised beds. Raised beds. That, that's it. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks for that. That was that was real tough. Um, we were going to make six of those ten foot square that would allow our system to dissipate uniformly into all that additional soil, and then dissipate into the the the, the mountaintop. But we weren't going to try to uh, uh, bore into the rock at all because it's not going to conduct ever. Uh, I'm getting off the track here, but a new power line was put in a couple of years ago uh, between a little town called Ellijay, Georgia and Chatsworth, Georgia. And they had to go across a mountain, a small, well, they, we call them mountains here, but they're big hills. They're made of rock. Uh, it's a big line. It's probably in the 250 KVA land. Pretty big, pretty big size. Um, somehow I bumped into a water well driller 
Well, I was buying some bentonite from from this outfit, and there was a water well driller in there, and he says, "Yeah, we got that job." I said, "What do you mean? You don't put in power lines?" He says, "No. At the base of every tower, we drilled a water well, a four inch casing water well, down till we got to liquid water, and then went ten feet past that." I said, "What for?" He says, "Well, after we did that, they took a ground rod, uh, bonded a conductor to it, and threw it in the in the in the well, and called it grounded." They've had lots of problems on that power line <laughs> since then. Uh, people come up with the crazy solutions for grounding. It's 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 not just a matter of putting a rod in water. Um, hey, can of, can I follow up? Please, um, anytime, so, anybody, follow up anytime. So I'm fascinated by the mountaintop grounding technique. So there's a formula to it, huh? I mean, you're telling me that there was a proposal for a ten by certain square foot area fill it up with soil, raised bed, and there's your ground system pretty good? Uh, our, our particular grounding system is very, very good at dissipating a tremendous amounts of current in a small area. Wow. Neat. Yeah. Well, that picture I showed of the tower getting hit in, in, uh, with the lightning strike hitting it, um, the first hit on that tower was we only had four of our electrodes in place. There are now 21 for the entire campus, but it's a half-acre-wide ca half campus uh, that includes five different buildings. It's all one big equipotential system. But we only had four electrodes in place when the first um, um, uh, direct hit happened. I was inside the studio building at the time and uh, everybody heard it and they said, uh-oh, tower hit. And then the intercom started to crackle to life and it was kind of like a NASA um, prior to countdown where they say, uh, guidance, go, range, go, uh, power plant, go, all that kind of stuff. Everybody checked in. Yes, I'm up. And then the station manager came on and said, has this ever happened before? We didn't lose anything. We were pretty impressed at that point. I was, I pretty much had a gun at my head at that time. But we, uh, it, it, we are able to dissipate huge amounts of current in very small areas. So that's why we proposed that system as opposed to trying to bore into the rock, which wasn't going to do anything. Um, that site did accept a proposal from a fellow who's going to put in a Motorola R56 system, which is going to require boring into rock and putting ground rods into the board holes. I expect to get a phone call from them in about a year to two years to say, come fix this. And maybe that's me being a little bit puffy, but I, th I think that's what's going to happen because it's just not going to conduct up there and they get lots of hits. Oops, there we go. So after you've done all these questions, Start to answer what, identify where you're weak. That's what you want to do with an audit. So I'm encouraging you all to do this. We, we can do it for you, but uh, we're not really set up to be nationwide at this point. Um, but take a look at it. You'll find weaknesses. I guarantee you'll find a lot of weaknesses. Uh, go machine, there we go. Two more things. I can't tell you the number of times I go to sites to evaluate the situation and I find split bolts and, and dissimilar metals uh, and mechanical connections for things that need to be absolutely irreversibly bonded. Um, it's everywhere. You've got to have that. And this happens a lot at hospitals we visit that are having problems blowing up their equipment. Hospitals like to grow. They like to add additional buildings. They put annexes on for this or that. Nobody pays attention to grounding. You got a different amount of electricity coming into a different point. You end up with competing grounding systems. Guess what happens? One grounding system can't digest it. It sends it off to the other grounding system. It goes upstream and fries an MRI at a cost of $2 million. Can't tell you the number of times we've seen that. So we've got to have equipotential across the entire site. Make sure you have that. Um, do you have broadband capability? Traditional grounding just doesn't have that. So it's kind of a rhetorical question, but be really careful when you look at this. Take, take a very careful look at your grounding. You're gonna save yourself a lot of trouble uh, over time. In 911, it's, it's much more um, critical because it is mission critical, of course. And, and again, human lives are in the, in, in the, in, 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 in the balance. Um, and I, earlier I said, this is the last thing you wanna think about. You got a lot on your mind. I understand that. But even if you do it once a year, just to get an idea how well you're, you're, you're held together grounding, it's, it's going to be better for you. We're doing a, uh, 
we're doing a T-Mobile upgrade on an AM tower here in Maine. And we've done just that. We've, we've tested the ground systems. We've looked at some points that are weak in the fencing and we've uh, rebonded, we put a skirt on the tower. So now grounding the, the tower itself is really important. And we've taken multiple steps to do that and then tie it in with four inch copper into the building. Uh, with strap? Yes. Okay. Um, um, I, I, uh, strap's great because you got that, that skin effect going on. Um, you can, our experience has been, you can do just, just fine with four out cable too. Um, in fact, a lot of our installations use nothing but four out and two out cable. It uh, seems like the, uh, the inductance would be relatively high compared to a uh, four inch strap. And so the, the high frequencies, uh, would develop a voltage across that. Another thing that I wonder about is I, I think that a big thing is the amount of surface area in contact with the earth and a ground rod is rather limited. My father used to tell the story in the 1930s for his amateur radio station, he buried a water heater and that was his ground system. <laughs> You're exactly right about ground rods. The surface area is minimal. Uh, this gets me in a lot of trouble but I can prove it um, very easily and uh, surprises us that nobody has done this. A ground rod only dissipates power from its tip at the very bottom. All the engineering texts you'll see out there talk about length of the ground rod and how that's important. And it will show so-called spheres of influence uniformly around the, around the ground rod. Um, in terms of electromagnetic charge, yes, it might be doing that. In terms of actual power dissipation of electrons, it's not doing that. The reason for that uh, has been determined uh, uh, theoretically and in, in practice. Uh, the the um, uh, um, impedance mismatch between copper and any kind of native soil is in, on the order of one trillion times. It's huge. Uh, electrons don't like to turn left at Poughkeepsie and go into a very, very highly resistive situation relative to the copper they're in. So they run down the ground rod. They try to get off at the end if, it, if they will jump off at the end. If they can't, they bounce right back and go up the system into your stuff. I was able to prove that that's the case very simply by hooking on a fall potential meter to a ground rod. And I've done this in four US states and I've gotten the same results. Um, in the case of Blue Ridge, Georgia, where I am right now, the installation uh, involved hitting rock at about 42 inches. Every six inches, I took a measurement of the resistivity uh, of the ground rod as I pounded it in the ground. As expected, for about the first 25, 24 inches, um, the resistance went, the resistivity went down with each six inch measurement. After that, it suddenly started to go up very much, very rapidly. Well, the only reason that, the only way that can happen is if I'm getting into a different layer of soil. But the rules say the more ground rod you put in the ground, the lower your resistance is going to be for resistivity, either one, use them in, in, almost interchangeably. Um, the the real problem started to happen about 40 inches. I was getting up to around 2,000 ohm, uh, ohm centimeters, uh, getting pretty, pretty, pretty resistive. Um, I then got down to 42 inches and the rod stopped moving. I suddenly spiked to 3,600. From the moment it hit rock, it spiked to 3,600. I hit it, and my arms will tell you this still, I hit that rod with a post pounder another 250 times. I got another quarter inch. I got over 4,000 ohm centimeters at that point. The only way that can happen with resistance going up that fast with additional depth is the only dissipating point is at the tip of the ground rod. That's important. A lot of people will tell you ground rods, you put in more ground rods, the more length the ground rod in the ground, the better you are. We don't mind that, but you're not going to get the bang for the buck that you think you're going to get. So that's that's uh, an interesting little tidbit. Oops, somebody's speaking, but I'm not hearing anything. 
anyway, that's the end of my show. That's 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 really it. But I, I'm sure I've generated a whole bunch of questions, uh, and hopefully I have. Mention that uh, there are different frequencies that you need to measure. Uh, typically, someone will go out with a VOM, uh, DVM, and they'll measure it, and that's really at uh, zero hertz, isn't it? Uh, we're not familiar with that. Okay. I'm not, a, not really a radio guy. Well, okay. What, uh, what would you think would be a normal move for a radio person or any person that doesn't have experience here and they'd start out by going from their ground bars to the neutral on the electrical service? or to a water pipe and evaluating the ground that way? Um, I don't want you, um, if, if you're evaluating the ground from your ground, your main ground bus is what you said? Yeah, that would be the place you know, to start. I, want, I don't want it to go the neutral. I want it to go out to a grounding system outside the building. And I really don't want you to use your plumbing as a grounding system. Did you mention that about a water pipe? I think I heard that. Yes. Yeah, I really don't want that because you have no guarantee that you have um, proper connectivity all the way through the system. In fact, a lot of plumbing systems are now plastic. At some point that you can't see, you may not have a ground there. You can also have a lot of other issues uh, when you energize the plumbing system in a building. When it gets hit, um, it, it can power can end up in all kinds of bad places, which we don't want to have happen. Or you can burst pipes. But even at that point, you're measuring basically at a DC point. There, there's no frequency involved. So um, the test meters inject a frequency. All right. Um, it, it, it's again, I don't know the innards of these test meters, but they do inject a frequency. That's what they measure. That's how they able to trace. This is how much of this frequency is coming back. So it is an AC event that they're putting in there. It's not just on off. Looking at that photograph you had, it, it appeared to be a, a clamp-on meter, and I can imagine that the um, the wire there is a similar to a single turn secondary. Uh, so then you can measure the impedance on the primary and determine the, the ground impedance through that. Uh, looking uh, on the web here, I'm seeing that there's also stuff about, if you try to do DC measurements, there's uh, the electrolyte uh, in the, in the earth will, uh, cause, uh, an inaccurate measurement. So they're normally making measurements at several hundred Hertz. Um, yes. that's what I've read so far anyway. And I, and I, and I back that up, uh, the, the clamp on meter I have is made by AEMC, which is the mega of, of, uh, of Europe, as it turns out. Um, and they were better priced than mega here. So that was, that was a good thing. Um, that gives me the choice of, I think six different frequencies. 50 hertz, 60 hertz, 127 hertz, uh, 180 something, and a 250, somewhere in that range. Um, and that's just to make sure that you're not going to be uh, stepped on by some other ambient frequency that might be out there to give you an inaccurate measurement. Um, but again, the little chart up at the top with a curve. That's a lightning strike. Would you like to explain that? Wait a second. There we go. Now it did. This is, if you can see where I am now, and I'm on there somehow too. That's a nice look on my face. My goodness. Um, can you all see it? Barry, can yes. you see it? Okay. That's a typical lightning strike um, over a very short period of time. The That's you doing that, I hope. The, the energy in a lightning strike is extremely high in the first couple of milliseconds, extremely high. And uh, a lot of research has been done on the components of that energy, and it is almost all extremely high frequencies. That's what causes problems for traditional grounding systems, because copper just doesn't do so well with those high frequencies as a dissipation device. Uh, north of 60 megahertz. Is that again getting back to skin effect as opposed to just 
copper. Uh, and so a larger diameter or uh, strap would do better. We're getting back to inductance, I think. And uh, possibly uh, what I need to do is refer you to, and I'll be more than happy to answer that question in more detail. Our chief scientist uh, we uh, acquired from Boeing and his job at Boeing was making aircraft safe from lightning. And he did pretty good with that. Uh, he's done lots and lots of research on lightning and he can answer that much better than I can. I'm just the CEO of this thing, it's all I am. So I rely on other people to answer a lot of the technical stuff. But uh, he's very into, he, he's very familiar with skin effect. Uh, and apparently it is copper, I've heard him say, it's copper as a whole does not do well with the high frequencies. It starts to drive, I've seen a graph of it, as a matter of fact, you get past 60 megahertz and the conductivity of copper starts to drop off very uh, um, uh, noticeably and not, may not be able to talk for a second, okay. Um, 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 it, 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 it stops to behave well and, and its, its ability to carry current and dissipate it drops off extremely fast. By 100 megahertz, it's really losing its ability. Thank you. I, I see in chat, somebody's asking about using a gas pipe for ground. I think that's a great way to get an explosion. I did also visit a, uh, a safety lab in North Carolina about 10 years ago on a different matter, but they, they told me about some uh, corrugated um, gas pipes, flexible gas pipes that were being used in walls and uh, a lightning strike uh, would then uh, puncture that gas wall and explode the house or ex explode the house. It is possible. Lightning and, and natural gas are bad things to put in the same room. Um, we have a big issue with using anything other than a true dissipating device, whether it's a ground rod or whether it's strap or whether what, what, or, or, or a chem rod. Uh, well, unfortunately, nobody ever maintains a chem rod ever. Um, uh, at least none of our experience. I've, been, I've seen, been to several hundred sites and never seen a, a maintained chem rod. In fact, lots of times the caps are corroded on, so you can't put more salts in it. Um, we much prefer the use of actual dissipation devices attaching to a, and, and the, the reason is the impedance difference as well between the pipe and soil. Electrons are not going to want to leave a pipeline going in a straight direction to dissipate into soil if it's so much more resistive. They're just not going to do it. And, and we've got lots of evidence that that's the case. They will stay in that line, in that metallic conductor, as long as they possibly can until they're kicked off by another electron behind them. And I'm speaking in, in layman's terms because I have to give these, these talks in layman's languages, not at the level that you all have to work at. Um, we, we find that, uh, again, the, the dissipation of charge happens at the end of the pipe, not along the sides of the pipe. So a gas line or a plumbing system, it's, it's not that it's in contact with ground. Electrons just don't make that change. They stay in the metal and they keep going at the speed of light in one direction. Does that help at all? Yes. Thank you. Using gas systems. I think also it's just dangerous. <laughs> well, on, on top of that, it's, it's incredibly dangerous, yes. Um, I, I think I did speak with you at NAB several years ago, and the uh, concept of a gradual transition of impedance was interesting and um, to uh, prevent reflections. And I'm, I'm still um, not exactly sure of it, but it is certainly interesting. Well, um, Mr. Belk, our chief scientist, uh, he continues to do research on it, and he's finding uh, the reflectivity is dropping off very, very quickly because we have uh, several steps within our compounds that surround our electrodes. Do you have that on the uh, website? Do you have any uh, published papers or anything on that so we can read further? Not on the exact uh, the, the details of, uh, of, of impedance mismatch or impedance gradients. We do refer to our system having impedance gradient. We didn't want to give away all our secrets. So, but there are there are a, a couple of white papers on the website, which is just groundlinks.com in the library tab. You'll see a few interesting things there. Thank you.
Tom, if copper isn't recommended, what do you recommend? We use copper in combination with carbon fiber. Carbon fiber. At which, at which end is what? The, the, they're together in a single electrode. And uh, I don't know if I have a, I'll have to hold up a picture here again because I don't have it easily. I'm using a new laptop that doesn't have all my photographs on it. So I, I apologize for that. Um, I'll so what do you use to get from your equipment to this electrode? Uh, a minimum of two watt stranded copper wire or tin copper wire. Let's see. Our electrodes are shaped like a barrel. Uh, here they are. Here they're stacked up, if you can see this. And I don't have, there it is, okay. Can you see them there? The black material is carbon fiber. The copper, of course, it's expanded copper metal and some solid copper sheet that we mold in, in uh, that we form into these electrodes. What happens in this case is the carbon fiber eats up the high frequency, loves high frequency, uh, and is, of course, extremely resilient with respect to heat. Each one of those electrodes we estimate is pretty much the equivalent of 18 million ground rods because there's so many little fibers in the carbon fiber, the ends of which are all emitting points. The edges on the expanded copper metal, electrons love to be at edges. They don't like to be on plate. Uh, they, they'll be on the surface, we know that. They won't be inside the copper, but they love to be on edges. Maybe one of you can answer this for me. In Europe, they're really big on using grounding plates. We can't find, we've tested them here in all kinds of configurations. We can't find that they're effective at grounding anything because you have just the edges that are, are effective. The, the surface doesn't really dispose of the electrons. Any, have, anybody have any input on that? Why grounding plates, are, the, the, that are, are you familiar with them being dis, uh, uh, deployed in your systems at all? And are what, about what about screen materials, like screening versus plates? Uh, screening we think would be more effective and we, we and our electrode we're basically using a screen but it's just expanded metal um, I think the problem with screening is that it's going to it's going to uh, deteriorate too quickly I think that the idea there probably is just getting back to surface area in contact with the earth uh, again and uh, that would be similar to the Ufer ground that uh, the uh, somewhat conductive concrete uh, still has a large surface area. Uh, what about uh, AM ground systems uh, have a lot of copper in the ground um, and then they typically will have a, a lightning gap at the base of the tower. Uh, does that AM ground system seems like it's gonna be pretty good. Uh, what's your experience on that? We haven't uh, had any success in attracting that business. Uh, I have seen the towers with the lightning gap with the big, the two spheres. In fact, I made reference to WSM's tower, and they have a rather large uh, lightning gap in there. Uh, at the called Johnny Ball. They're called Johnny Balls. Johnny Balls is what they're called? Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. Okay, now I know. <laughs> I think those are the insulators on the guys. And you're, you're talking about the lightning gap, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, now, the, the radials, uh, I, I suspect it would be, but uh, we don't want to use that as a ground uh, for the tower. Right, because the tower needs to be independent from your, from the other half of your antenna, which is the ground, right, which is your radial system. Do I understand that correctly about AM broadcast? Well, uh, the tower is fed against ground, so it is indeed the other side. But the lightning gap uh, will typically be between the tower and the uh, the radial ground system. Okay, so they're not connected. You don't want them connected because you're gonna have the other half of the antenna. I get that but it will dispatch lightning into that grounding system to that, to that, to that ground array. That's oh, yeah. what's oh, yeah. supposed to happen. Yeah. Yeah. It arcs actually, over and just the sees the ground. Yeah. But I have, I have two, two inputs. It just arcs over the gap to the ground. Right. Yep. Okay. That makes perfect sense. Does it work? Yeah, it works, real, works really well. I actually have a video in uh, Camden, New Jersey of a lightning storm and I was in the building and I put my telephoto lens on the Johnny balls and saw it arc. It was pretty impressive. Was it from a direct hit or was it just from induced current in the air? Oh no, it was a direct hit at the top of the tower. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah. Uh, well, do, do we know if there's any damage to the 
ground plane at that point? None, none whatsoever. The, the, uh, the grounding system at that site was uh, heavily fortified. And I'm doing the same thing here in Maine right now. We've okay. taken a hot AM tower and turned it to ground and put a skirt around it. So now grounding is very, very important you know, to bring that tower down to ground potential. Okay, okay, perfect, great idea. In this case, it's just the amount of metal that you put in the ground. Exactly, I sent some pictures to Barry of what we just did, I don't know if he has them or not, but yeah, that's, that's what we were doing here. And we did four inch strap, brazed it to the tower, brazed it to the existing ground system, and there you go. Okay. Um, you were uh, talking I, about the uh, sharp edge of the grounding stake is where it dissipates into the actual earth. What if those plates in Europe just had extremely sharp edges all the way around? Yeah, they do, but they're small. There's just not enough. Now, uh, anecdotally, I was overseas in, in uh, October um, in southern France and around Italy, and I got talking to one of our tour guides. If I taught grounding, I get to write off the trip. Ha! Um, so the tour guide that I was speaking with said, yes, we." Uh, she said, Marseille has 300 days of sunshine. I said, what happens on the other 65 days? She says, it rains like, how do you say? It rains like hell. <laughs> I said, are there thunderstorms in there? She says, yes, they're bad. I said, do you have any issues here with thunderstorms causing damage to electronics? And surprisingly, she knew the answer to that. She says, yes, it's terrible. She said, I used to live in Paris. When we have a thunderstorm in Paris, which is all ground plates, that's all they do. When they, of course, in, in Europe, you're, you're, you're dealing with a Y transformer, sometimes 300 meters away, that is the ground. The old buildings don't have three wires in them. It's the neutral, it goes back to the Y transformer at a kiosk, wherever it may be down the street. And that's the only ground they have. So they have terrible grounding in their old buildings. She says in Paris, when a thunderstorm comes through, everybody panics and runs around unplugging everything. The only grounding they have is a plate, is plates beneath those, the uh, serving transformers. Um, I suspect in the case of an AM tower, you could probably put a tremendous amount of plates in place and get some good performance. I don't know what these radials look like other than just wires. And I have, I've not, I honestly, in full disclosure, I have not studied this at all. In our system, we use the expanded metal because it creates a tremendous number of edges inside and out in a very small space. We have, ex we have exhumed our electrodes after we know they've been hit and they show no damage, which surprised us. The carbon Jim's fiber- got a question ahead. here about grounded rod depth. Yeah, so the question um, that I have is, you know, you were talking about, it's all about the tip and, you, and there's code, A, there's code with, you know, what a municipality will say, you gotta be eight foot, whatever. What do you say? I mean, it sounds like, and I'm, and I'm very interested in these test meters if they're affordable and I could become proficient, seems as if you just drive it down and go for, you know, the closest you can get to true ground right where you're at. Okay. Um, let me quote chapter 250, not word for word, but what it says, chapter 250 of the National Electric Code. Mm -hmm. It says, buy a ground rod, pound it in the ground, and get out your handy test meter, which they cost about $1,500 to answer your question about affordability. You can get cheap Chinese ones, but and they'll be about 300 bucks on Amazon. They'll last about a week and a half. Okay. Um, um, maybe a little bit longer. I don't mean to disparage anybody. Uh, and certainly not Jeff Bezos. The, um, it says, put a ground run in the ground and check it. If it's 25 ohms or less, go home. Exception. If it's not 25 ohms, put in a second ground rod and go home. It doesn't say check the system. So what electricians do is they just buy two ground rods and skip the meter. I'm in this very business because my house was struck by lightning in 2014, shortly after it was built. I watched the electrician put in two ground rods. To show you how much I knew about grounding back then, I leaned over the edge of the deck and I said, what are those down there? He, he looked up, he says, we call them ground rods. I said, what do they do? He says, I don't know. We just have to put him in. That was the extent of his knowledge. Mm. My house got hit by lightning about six months later. I lost almost everything electronic in the house. Uh, uh, cable boxes, TVs, computers, uh, refrigerator went out. Took, it got taken out. 
I went out and bought a test meter. I paid fifteen hundred dollars for one. That's the one you saw pictured, as a matter of fact. Um, my system measured five hundred and forty ohms to ground that day. I measured it every day after that. It averaged around five hundred twenty-five. That's not a ground. That's just that's nothing. About three years later, after we developed our first product and had it in place at a, at a barn on the property, lightning hit the steel roof of the barn. I had a, I, I call it, I'm, I, this may be inaccurate, but I call it a plasma flash, come off, the, come out of the panel. Is that, does that, is that the right terminology? A big white flash. Um, I see, I see uh, um, the man in Maine, Tim, I see you shaking your head up and down. So I, I guess that's what it is. Uh, oh, look at that. Yeah, that's serious. That's pretty serious. Okay. Uh, anyway, had a plasma flash come out of the out of the, uh, um, the panel. I then ran to change my underwear, of course, and uh, uh, I thought we were going to burn at that point. I thought everything was going to go haywire, and it didn't. The flash, of course, went away, and there was no smoke, and there was no nothing. We had three of our prototypes in place in the ground. Uh, I walked over to the panel and inspected every wire inside and out. There was no damage to any, and no singeing, no melting, no nothing. I, plug, I, I turned on every tool that was plugged in. This was my workshop. All the motors worked fine. There was no damage to anything. Called up one of my partners and said, John, get over here. We got something. We dug it out of the ground and it looked that one of the three, the first in line and looked like nothing had happened to it. Uh, Somehow the combination of copper and carbon fiber does something amazing. And we think what happens for those of you that are much more familiar with the electronics going on here, uh, and there are the Johnny balls, I see them in the picture. Um, it appears that our electrode turns into a giant capacitor uh, and it allows that steep wave front to be digested over the time of the high frequencies and gets rid of it and it allows the low frequencies to come in at that point and be dissipated. Um, another addition that we have in our particular, I showed this picture with the electrodes, see if it shows up. It's not showing real well there, it's kind of settling down. Inside that void, we put in a paste that we make. Mm -hmm. If anybody can see that. Yep, I've seen that. Yeah, that, and you may see that, some of the, like that on the website. Um, that paste is a permanent moisture supply, which we don't rely on because the system really doesn't have to have it, although that stays moist all the time. And then the black material we also manufacture, that's molded to the outside of the electrode. And that's where that impedance gradient happens. I think, was that you, Mike, that was talking about impedance gradient? No. No, no it was me, go ahead. Uh, okay, sorry about that. Oh, and, and Mike, I see you're in Richmond, Virginia. Did you recognize the tower? Um, I didn't see the tower. Uh, was it, 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 which one was it? I'm very familiar. <laughs> yeah. Uh, anyway, they've, they've, had, they've had lots of issues there. Oh yeah. Lots and lots of issues, but they haven't had anything in four hits now. Great. So we're very, very happy about that. Uh, uh, let's see, I'm unmuted, okay. So uh, this is 1400 AM in Biddeford, Maine. And if this was a grounded tower, I'm sorry, this was a floating hot tower. Get my thoughts corrected here. And um, so what we've done is T-Mobile has come in now and put in their new 5G stuff. And uh, we've decided to skirt the tower instead of having the tower as the radiator. And I don't know, I didn't send those pictures to Barry, but what you're seeing here, Phil Harris from SiteSafe, you probably many of you know Phil, Phil's working with me on this. And um, so what we're doing is uh, we've regrounded and bonded the tower base uh, to the existing ground system. And we've tested it, it looks pretty darn good, make it, making it out. I'm sorry, and, Kim, uh, those were the pictures that were in your email. Yes. Yep, those are the ones I sent you last week. So I just wanted to, see, and when I found out you were doing the grounding thing, I'm like, well, this is what we did. So I just wanted to kind of show that. Um, but I have a question. So on a tower now that's it's ground potential, and we're putting ground kits on the tower. A lot of ground, a lot of tower companies just use a uh, uh, a ground kit. They put a lug on it and they put a beam clamp on the tower. That's a no-no in my mind. That's a big no-no. 
you got to be a little more um, elaborate in your in your grounding. I've been to as I say, well. What I what I what I proposed to these guys, Tom, is you got to CAD weld these things every fifty feet. These are hybrid cables now for these cell sites. And since the skirt is on the tower now, we have to ground, everything has to go down to ground potential. It does. So the guys were like, well, we're just going to put beam clamps and grounds like we do all the time. And like, nope, not on this site. You've got a CAD weld every 50 feet, every single ground on all three hybrids up and down the tower. And my existing half inch SDL also has to get grounded. Uh, everything has to be grounded and it has to be at the same potential. Absolutely. Uh, the number of errors that we see, and we're not experts on every aspect of grounding yet, but what we have, we know is working uh, and working much better than any form of traditional grounding. Uh, we use CAD welds uh, uh, exclusively up until about, well, until we started doing the Richmond job, because a, a lot of the grounding work we had to do in Richmond um, for Mike, uh, if you are still there, I hope you are. Um, yes, yeah. I'm here. Uh, the roof of the studio building mm -hmm. has 15 satellite dishes on it and uh, 28 HVAC condensers. What was happening on that tower, and again, this is not for publication to anybody, if you will, please, because they don't, Scripps doesn't want me to tell all that. Um, the tower would take a hit. And because the grounding on the tower was so terrible, the current would not continue down the tower. It would air gap, and we have a witness, a Richmond police officer saw it, it air gaps over to all the crap on the top of the roof. None of which was grounded other than through the electrical system. So you hit the case of a HVAC unit, you're hitting the neutral basically. It air gapped from the tower over to a sharp pointy thing on the roof and infected the entire neutral system of the studio and would cook whatever it wanted to cook. Hmm. We, had to, we had to connect every one of those satellite dishes and every one of those HVAC units with two watt cable, and those go to five different electrodes, all in a all in a giant array up there. Um, I got off track there somehow, but uh, it's it's so important to have everything at the, at the same potential throughout a site. You just mentioned uh, CAD weld, and John asked, ah, yes. CAD weld possibly damage the integrity of the tower steel." Uh, let me go back. The question was, uh, was CAD welds versus what we went to? We changed at Richmond because we had to be up on the roof. That was the connection there. That was the segue. You can't do CAD welding on somebody's roof. It's um, a little too dangerous. We could have we burned the place down pretty quickly, which we wouldn't want to do. That'd be bad for our business. Uh, so we went to 12-ton CTAP compression fittings that are irreversible. They are allowed and we find out, we're finding now that they are much more reliable than a CAD weld because a CAD weld can have chemical differences that you can't know about. It's supposed to be perfect, but unless you hit it with a hammer sometimes, you don't know if it's a good bond. Uh, a lot of our work was done at ground level. Doing CAD welds in dirt or near dirt becomes very, very dangerous because there can be a, just the tiniest bit of moisture nearby and you're gonna have 3,500 degree Celsius hot metal flying at you very, very fast. So we went to these 12 ton clamps, uh, uh, CTAPs, and we're getting absolutely superior results uh, with the quality of the connection and they are completely irreversible. Hmm. That's uh, C, uh, CTAP you say? Yeah. Tank, okay. Um, I can go get one if you all can stand by. I've, it's I'd love to see one. Hang on yeah, just one uh, second. If everybody, if everybody will bear with me, I'll run get one. Given what Great. I'm doing right now, yeah, I'd love to see one. That sounds and, like and, the uh, gas gas tight connections of wire wrap or something like that. Somebody put an interesting question in uh, chat about uh, uh, welding uh, messing up the integrity of the of the tower steel. And I'm working on a project right now, and it's interesting. The drawings say, you know, do not weld the rebar. They're concerned about damaging that. So. That is an interesting comment. I never, I'm having a, a Cadwell job being done today at a transmitter site. Um, I never considered on the leg the impact of that. But you know what? We've got at other sites far more serious issues with the integrity of the tower involving rust. <laughs> Just saying. If you Cad weld it the right way and you test the connection, usually they come out pretty well. I think I've had two fail out of thousands. Yeah. Yeah, okay, that's I'm holding point. up. I'm holding up a C tab. 
I see it. Ah, I've seen them before. They're used by linemen primarily. Okay. Yeah. In in yeah. our application, there's one attached to some two watt wire and a mm -hmm. uh, short ground rod. Yeah. Hey, hey. So in my building right now, I'm looking at my ring. There is um, the bonding on that ring of something similar to that. It's copper, but it's round. It totally encloses over it. Is that the same concept? It looks like they just crimped it. Yep, here it is. Yeah, exactly. That's also acceptable, correct? Yes. Okay. You put so much pressure on the wire when you're clamping it down, yeah. the wire almost becomes solid. Okay, yeah. And it, they get hot as well. Not really hot to the touch, but they get warm. It's just there's so much pressure put on the uh, put on the joint, and they okay. are absolutely irreversible. For an added measure of fun, you put a little squirt of Nolox in the in the gap mm -hmm. before you clamp it down, and you've got a really really good connection at that point. Although Nolox working with Nolox is no fun because it's going to get on you no matter what you do, and it, it doesn't like to come off. So. Um, uh, more questions. I, I'm, I'm trying to, uh, y'all are, are, are so much beyond me as far as radio engineering goes, uh, and I'm trying to answer as best I can. Um, just know that grounding is critical, and so many people don't pay enough attention to it. Now, my uh, first apartment in New York City faced the Empire State Building, and one of the great entertainments was watching lightning strike the antenna. Now, rarely was there severe damage done. Now, is it safe to assume that the entire steel skeleton buried, you know, probably eight uh, sub-basements below? Well, it's is, down into bedrock. Yes. Hey, Rich, Rich, I've been in the Empire State Building when it's been hit by lightning, and I was on the, up on the 85 where the Minimaster is, and it hit the side of the building, and I'll tell you, you change your pants. <laughs> I, I don't doubt that, but, um, you know, during storms, rarely do I ever see a, or hear a station go off the air. So I have to assume that there's so much surface, maybe sharp surface, um, you know, below the building. I suspect it's it's connected to the red iron, and 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 red iron has to be grounded in any structure. Mm -hmm. I suspect they've they've connected to that, and you're dissipating that current over so much of of so much steel that by the time it gets to the to 100 floors down or 85 floors down or whatever it is, there's not a whole lot of lot of go power left in it. Yeah, the and spire it, the spire that's all metal is so heavily grounded all throughout the building. You. Can, you can see ground points and, and so forth. It's pretty extensive and it does dissipate down through the building. I don't think anybody's had any serious hits on those top floors since they've redone the, the, uh, the spire. Uh, and the, the, from a broadcast standpoint, I think, I think it's ERI. Are you all familiar with ERI? Yeah, it was ERI. Yeah, yeah ERI maintains, well, in fact, <laughs> Tom Silliman still climbs that tower and he's 73 yes, he does. years old. Yeah, yeah. And, he, and, and he's invited me up several times, but uh, I did it in the old days, but not now. It's, it's he's like, still, he's still, he's 73 and he's still climbing. Well, he's, he's three years older than I am and he's still doing it. So good for him. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm happy for him. I, I've, I've talked to him a number of times up in Chandler uh, and he's a wonderful guy. But um, what are, they, are, four, are there 42 transmitters up there? Is that what it is? It's some big number. Uh, I can't yeah, remember. Quite a few, and um, <clears throat> excuse me, a number had moved to the uh, new Freedom Tower. Well, the FMs, the FMs are all still on Empire. Their backup is four times square, which is also an amazing site for grounding. Right. And then a well, lot I, of them have a lot of them have oxes out in New Jersey as well. But uh, yeah. yeah, John Lyons did a great job on the new World Trade Center. When you see that thing, it's it's phenomenal. Yeah. Just phenomenal. So my uh, office at WOR overlooked for Times Square. So I watched that building go up. And I also watched the uh, crane or the elevator on the side come loose and you know, go into the uh, hotel across the street. And it killed a woman in her bed. But uh, you know, it was quite a thing to watch that, uh, that go up. 
I actually had the opportunity to uh, go up on four Times Square while Tom was building that uh, arrangement. And one of the things, and never forget this, Tom is so observant, constantly watch your foot, watch your head, be careful, <laughs> constantly obsessed with safety up there. And no, I was not on the top of the uh, Empire uh, Tower. Uh, that was enough to be on four times square for me. But I've never seen someone with as much attention to safety as Tom Silliman. I wish he had been with me. Um, of Andy Bader, WPIX-FM, was my chief engineer. He took me up to the old World Trade to the roof. Mm -hmm. And just below the roof, uh, where the arches were, uh, if you're on the roof and you fall over, you're only going to fall down one flight into the uh, window washer tracks. But if you're in that area, which is where, um, it's a straight trip down. And uh, I nearly, nearly fell over. I'm, I had a trench coat on. And there's a, uh, a huge, was a huge fan going into the transmitter, one of the transmitter rooms. Yeah, and it just sucked yeah. my, my uh, uh, coat in. And uh, it, I think I had to change everything after that. <laughs> yeah, I worked, on the no I worked on the North Tower for two years doing a 67th translator. And... Uh, I've been in that building and that's been hit. All you hear is the big boom. You don't, you don't feel it, but you can hear the crack and then you know it's, it's going through the building. But uh, right. it's, mm -hmm. those are so big and so well grounded that there, there was no effect. But I have Tom, leaned over that building and taken a picture to ground. Tom, we've had you for about an hour and a half now and we appreciate it. I'm not chasing you away, but if you need to run, I want to give you an out. Well, I, I appreciate that. I've got, to go, I've got to talk to a lawyer here pretty soon, so I'm putting that off as much as I can. <laughs> But um, um, we unfortunately had a partner go rogue on us, and we're having to deal with that. But we really do appreciate your being here. I'll welcome you back another time to talk some more, show some more uh, pictures and examples, maybe, that uh, will help eliminate what's going on. Yeah. And Barry, I'm, I'm grateful to you and your entire group. I don't want this to become, uh, if, if I'm back, I, I don't ever want to do this for commercial purposes. That's not my point. Um, and that, that's what I say to any presentation. If I can get you all to think more about grounding, I've accomplished my goal. At some point, you may call me up and say, we got to do some better grounding. Maybe you can do it. That's fine. But that's not what I'm doing this for. So, and hopefully everybody under, uh, appreciates that and understands that. Um, are there any other questions um, that are uh, burning away in your brains right now that, that I can answer um, or try to answer? How do we get your contact information, Tom? Um, uh, I will be happy to send it to you, but uh, simply email me at Tom Labarge, T-O-M-L-A-B-A-R-G-E, T-O-M-L-A-B-A-R-G-E, at groundlinks, G-R-O-U-N-D-L-I-N-X, dot com. You can also find us on the web. There's a link there to contact us on the website. Thanks, Tom. Great presentation. Appreciate it. Well, it's, it's, I, I got to get better at these things. Um, I, I get so passionate about what we're doing here because it's really changing the way things need to be done. Not, I'm not saying it's the best way, but a lot of the junk that's out there, a lot of the grounding problems that are out there are just, just hilarious. I showed you some of them. There's our little ad right there, groundlinks.com. Um, I will advertise, uh, yeah, there's the website as well. Thank you, Barry. Um, I will indicate here as well, two days ago, we were granted our third patent, which is, uh, <coughs> excuse me, a pretty big deal for us. Uh, and it will be eventually rolled out into 32 countries. Um, but we've patented the concept of gradients in impedance matching, uh, which will make things work a lot better. What we've created with, with, with this, the black material that you may have seen on the photograph I held up, what we've created is, is um, a fish ladder for electrons, as opposed to coming up to a dam 
where you can't jump it, we give you a fish ladder and it makes the electrons much more inclined, if you will, to move into native soil. We're adding layers to that. There's the get in contact, there you go. And that will, that will end up on my phone very quickly. Um, um, what we're finding is um, um, that we, we can put additional materials in this black stuff and we can get a different range of frequencies dissipated. It's kind of fun to see what we can get together. There is an indication um, theoretically that we're gonna be able to be useful in dissipating EMP of all things. And that involves a particular set of materials that I can't discuss, of course. But uh, if we can get uh, EMP, oh, that was the backdrop for our NAB booth, that, that highway sign. Um, the, uh, on here in the library, thank you, Barry, you're doing a great job. Um, here are some of the press releases that we've put out. Uh, and and uh, there's the WTVR, which is supposed to have a photograph on it, but didn't. Um, it was supposed to be a photograph buried in there. My, my website guy didn't do it. Um, the, uh, if we can get rid of EMP and hook that up in a, in a military application, that's, that's going to change things an awful lot. But we're able to handle tremendous ranges of frequencies with this new patent. And, and we're looking forward to moving forward with that um, um, commercially. And yeah, don't show that radio world thing, Barry. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> There's going to be one on the BDR very soon, isn't there? There is. Yeah, you keep nudging me on that, but I've had this little little company to run in the meantime, and it's it's kind of kind of hard to keep all of that going. Uh, that was a good case of bad grounding. Uh, that right. Uh, well, there's a really old case of grounding. That's in my living room, as it turns out now. Uh, where was it? The very top of that page, I think. There you go. Yeah, that's that's not the best way to do it. I'm thinking it, it'll work, but I'm seeing some metal issues there. That's at an air traffic control tower. It's kind of bothersome. Any other questions? Oh, uh, who is that that has the earth? It's not Tim Braddock's blow, Tim. Who is that? Let me see if I can. I love your backdrop, whoever this is. Oops, you took it away from me. Oh. Daryl. Great backdrop, Daryl. <laughs> there he is. <laughs> Last call for questions, and I got to go talk to an attorney. Well, again, our sincere thanks to you for. The presentation. Uh, as I say, hope you come back and show us some before and after shots of uh, some of the ground measurements as well as the installation. I, I can I can do that, um, and I'll try to make it as comedic as I can. We've all seen some comedic installations, I'm sure. Uh, and, and again, I apologize. I'm not an engineer, by no means. Uh, I'm learning your side of the business as fast as I can. I just want to make your side of the business easier to operate. Thank you all for your time. Thanks, Tom.